Coming up on 2020 on ID. A big mansion with a dark secret. A brilliant wife and devoted mother fleeing her enraged husband, covered in blood and nearly dead. It was like out of a, out of a horror movie. But not just any husband, a West Wing power player, legal advisor to presidents. The world saw his fame. Only she saw his fury. As he was throwing my head on the floor, he said, I'm killing you. What finally pushed him over the edge? Don't touch this. Wash your hands. Take your shoes off. It was like a year of terror. And why did he take the fifth 94 times? I will not respond. I'm not going to respond. I'll respond to the question. You think you can handle it? And you know what? You can't. Live to tell. Plus, the fiancé with murder on her mind. Caught on tape, giggling, singing. All the while hiring a hitman to do in her man. You really want to do this? Really? And you won't believe who she turned to for help. Honey, I don't know if you can do anything. My body started to shake. Love you to death. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Knowing when to get out of a relationship is always tricky. But for the people you're about to meet, it became a matter of life and death. First, a woman with a husband who wasn't just financially successful, he was a power player in the inner circles of Washington. But it wasn't political scandal that would be his downfall. As Amy Robach first told us in 2015, it was the horror of what was going on behind the walls of their stately mansion, a secret that would send his wife running for her life. A frozen night, a dark road, headlights, a heart-pounding pedal-to-the-metal getaway. Mary Margaret Farron and her wide-eyed little girls, a seven-year-old and a four-month-old baby. The baby not buckled in her pajamas on the passenger seat, and my older daughter was sitting in the back seat. A BMW weaving past the mansions on Wahackney Road, New Canaan, Connecticut. They call their wealthy town the next stop to heaven, but it is far from heaven this night. I go the way I know, which is toward the town and to get toward people. And I don't pull into the first house because I'm afraid he's going to pull in right behind me. Mary Margaret on the run from a brutal assault in her bedroom. The attacker, her husband, J. Michael Farron. It was horrific. I was covered in blood. What looked like a wonderful life vanishing behind them. I looked in the rearview mirror and I saw it was black, it was dark, so I knew he wasn't behind. And then I thought, okay, where do I go? Objects in that rearview mirror are stranger than they appear. A 12 year marriage to one of the most powerful men in Washington, a life of privilege and prestige. A $5 million mansion in New Canaan, one of the richest towns in America, with neighbors like Harry Connick Jr singer Paul Simon and scandal star Tony Goldwyn. All that is behind her now. Mary Margaret spent years after the attack living in hiding, fearing for her life. Now she's agreed to come out of the shadows for this first interview, ready to talk about the family secret that almost killed her. And tell me why you want to share your story. I think when the severity of abuse gets to where I ended up with, most women in that situation never get to speak out because they're dead. But I felt it was just critical to speak out and to caution women in terms of getting involved with someone who shows these abusive tendencies. The story of this nearly fatal marriage begins more than a dozen years earlier with Cherry Blossoms, a springtime romance in the nation's capital. I had just graduated from law school and uh, moved to DC. I had a job and I was gonna be studying for the bar exam. Through a mutual friend, we met each other at dinner and we hit it off. We started dating pretty quickly and and it was amazing. We had incredible conversations and we went running together and we would be out gardening at his house. I was drawn to him and I thought he was intriguing. I was captivated after some time. The captivating Mr. Farron is a Washington power player, an attorney with an impressive resume. This guy is a serious lawyer. General counsel of Xerox, worked in the Bush administration, had held serious positions in government. This was a very senior, prominent attorney. A search of ABC archives finds Farron holding a news conference in the 90s. We had hoped that we'd see our overall trade imbalance go down below 
uh, $100 billion. Testifying before Congress. Mr. Chairman, I've uh, prepared a written statement which I've submitted to the uh, committee. Appearing on the weekly ABC News program Business World when he was an undersecretary at the Commerce Department. The last thing we want to do is to drive U.S. production of any product offshore. Now with Mary Margaret by his side, there are a couple to be envied. An all-access pass to all the power and privilege the Capitol has to offer. Here they are, posing with First Lady Hillary Clinton after she had them over for tea at the White House. And there's President Bill Clinton welcoming the Ferrans to movie night at the White House Theater in 1999. A private screening of the horror movie Lake Placid featuring a giant man-eating crocodile. All the while, Mary Margaret says, just beneath the surface of her husband's public persona lurked a scary dark side. Out of the blue, he would just go into this rage, that jealousy, saying, I had spoken too long to someone at a cocktail party. And I kept thinking, well, he's just insecure because of our difference in our age. He's 13 years older than I am. And things do get better, or so it seems. Things all of a sudden went really smoothly. But in hindsight, what I realized is that I had completely altered my behavior. I didn't go out with girlfriends. Um, I made sure that I was reachable at all times. I never stood too close to anyone at a cocktail party. I made sure I was attentive to him. And so you become so well behaved in his eyes and things are really calm. And what was your wedding day like? Um, it was horrible. He got very angry at me. He got very angry that I hadn't remembered to bring his mother's plane ticket. And I'm sitting on that altar thinking, what am I doing? Who am I marrying? Yeah. And I'm smiling and trying to make everything happy and turn it into a happy day. And I'm si seriously sitting there thinking, run, just run. But she doesn't. And within days, Farron's temper flares again. On the honeymoon, he found out that I had some credit card debt from buying my wedding gown and buying him a groom's present and a pair of cufflinks. And he went berserk. He was screaming in that complete enraged tone. Still, Mary Margaret tries to remain hopeful. I'm an optimist to a fault. I always think that, well, geez, I'm a problem solver. We can figure it out. We can get this done. We can work things out. And she tried. They have two daughters and eventually trade Washington for the big house in Connecticut, the new first family of New Canaan. He wanted to move back to Connecticut, and I thought, he's going to be happier. It's going to be a calmer. The pressure is going to be off him. Yeah, and then he'll be nice. He'll be doing what he wants. He won't have this high-pressure job. And I was so wrong. It got worse. So much worse. So much worse. It was like a year of terror. The man who once worked in the White House a tyrant in his own house, barking orders, compulsively obsessing over every detail of his wife and daughter's life. Don't touch this. Wash your hands. Take your shoes off. Controlling, like, don't eat that way. Telling our daughter, like, don't eat your food that way. And it was exhausting. I mean, there were so many rules. Rules and constant fear. I just would say to him, I think you're going to hit me eventually. And he would say, oh, Mary Margaret, like, never, ever ever hurt you. After years of agonizing, Mary Margaret makes a life-changing decision. She decides to pull the plug on her dying marriage, but with a husband like hers, she knows she's also pulling the pin on a grenade. Making sure she and the girls are out of the house, she has Farron served with divorce papers. Were you nervous about doing that? I was terrified. I was so scared, and I made sure our older daughter was at school, and I took the baby and went to another mom's house, and while he got served. Did he know it was coming? Did he no, have any idea? He did not know. And what was his reaction? He called me and he said, are you going to come home so we can discuss this? And I was crying on the phone and I said, I'm scared to come home. And I said, is it safe for me to come home? And he said, yes. When we come back, Mary Margaret and the girls come home. And then you go into the master bedroom. And what happens? Stay with us. At the $5 million Farron Mansion in New Canaan, Connecticut, trouble is brewing as surely as another winter storm. 
Mary Margaret Farron is increasingly worried about her husband's tantrums and explosive anger. Yes, my name is J. Michael Farron had risen to the highest levels of government. Senator, we need an effectively funded... Negotiating international trade agreements, agreements at the Curtis Commerce Man Department. Representing the president on legal matters. General counsel at Xerox. His career, a brilliant success. But his marriage, a miserable failure. He would always threaten to, like, I'm going to ruin your career or I'm going to... You know, embarrass you, and in terms of calling people I know at your firm or things, and or as you're sitting there at a client dinner, which I went to very few of because it was so difficult. But and your husband is robo dialing you, and s people can hear him screaming through the phone, and it's just it's embarrassing. What did he say to therapy? No, he said I'm proud of who I am. He said I'm not going to go talk to somebody. I like who I am. No. What was the final straw, where you said? That's it, I have to file divorce papers. Our um, older daughter was growing up and challenging him, but then also feeling his rage, starting to see her take the same strategies that I would to avoid triggering his rage, just broke my heart. After she has him served with divorce papers, Farron talks Mary Margaret into coming home with the girls. I did fear that he would slap me or push me or do something. So you didn't think your life was going to be in danger. I thought I could manage it. I thought I but could she has an escape I plan. I know that when you went back home, you were strategic. You thought, just in case things don't go well, you put your keys in your car. I did. I thought he would fly into a rage. And I did not want to have the children there during that, if that happened. And I wanted to be able to leave quickly. The divorce ignites J. Michael Farron. Two nights later, he attacks. You put the children to bed, mm -hmm. your baby in her crib, and then you go into the master bedroom, mm -hmm. and he's there in his pajamas? Yes. And what happens? He came at me, he put his hands out, and he put his hands around my neck, tackled me to the floor, and started slamming my head into the floor while he was strangling me. He's punching me ripping out my hair. I mean, I felt like I was being scalped. As he was slamming my head into the floor, he said, I'm killing you. With his children just down the hall in their beds, the former deputy counsel to the president of the United States then begins clubbing his wife with a metal flashlight. And I thought, I'm dying. And then I was thinking, I've got to hold it together. I have to stay conscious so I can save the girls. I have to get help here. Mary Margaret pleads with her husband. His reaction is icy. I said, Mike, we can work this out. Please stop, we can work this out. And he said in this very cold, steady voice, you're just saying that because you're scared. And he continued to beat me with a flashlight. And at that moment I realized this isn't going to end except when I'm dead. I mean, there was no way you could get free. He was so goal-oriented and so purposeful. And, and so calm, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, and that's what made it so chilling. And, and then I'm laying on the floor and falling into unconsciousness again. And he says he's going to the kitchen to get a knife, to kill himself, is what he said. And I thought, knife is probably meant for me. Then and there, Mary Margaret, nearly blinded by blood, decides to save herself and her girls. By the grace of God or angels, I just popped up and I ran to our daughter's room and I said to the car right now, Daddy's trying to kill me. You got the baby. I got, I got the baby. I held her like a football under my arm and I went down the back stairs, like tripping all the way. They make it to the car. Thank God those keys were there. Thank God. Out of the garage and down the road to safety. Up until that moment, you felt like you were being chased. I did. I couldn't even look in the rearview mirror because I could barely stay on the road. Fighting unconsciousness, swerving into the first house with lights on. And I put on the horn and I stumbled to the door. And that incredible family that lived in that house, they opened the door. And I said, my husband tried to kill me and my daughters are in the car. And then I just collapsed inside 
the door. I heard a loud screeching outside and then a, the blare of a horn. Get yourself comfortable, ma'am. Barbara and John Ackenbaum will later testify the about the late night callers they will and never forget. <laughs> So there was a window next to the door, and in the window, I saw a, a really, really horrifying sight. I mean, it was like out of a, out of a horror movie. Had blood all over her face, her hair. Her hair was kind of wild, and full. Of, and there was blood all over her face and on her clothes. And she uh, began screaming to me, "My husband's trying to kill me. I'm going to die." She kind of collapsed into my arms and then onto the ground. She almost like melted into the floor. She was very agitated, and she kept saying, "You know, my husband tried to kill me." Are my kids okay? And I can just see this pool of red blood expanding quickly on the floor. And then I see my daughter, and she tried to step over the blood, and she said, Mommy. I thought that was the last time I would hear her voice. And then when you woke up in that hospital, despite everything you had been through, you say you felt relief. My mom said that I said to her, I said, Mom, it's over. We're free. Police photographed the clothes she was wearing, the purple nightgown, the pink robe. The officers so stunned by her injuries, they decide to videotape her right in the emergency room. We must caution you, the images are graphic. He was strangling me for really hard. I mean, I was, you know, like my eyesight went. And then with the flashlight, I mean, he just kept hitting me and hitting me with that flashlight. You had a tremendous amount of injuries. A broken jaw, fractures in my, on my cheeks, huge lacerations and wounds on my head. They put big staples down my forehead. She suffered brain damage and PTSD. Even her smile is permanently altered. Oh God. This side of my face, my smile doesn't go up on this side anymore. A lot of work, physical therapy was done because there was such scar tissue and I worked on that for a long time. Mary Margaret spends six days in the hospital. Prosecutors charge Farron with assault and attempted murder. When we come back, Farron facing lawsuits and criminal charges, a man used to barking out orders, answering tough questions, what he has to say for himself. What you were intending on doing is killing her in this brutal way. Isn't that right, Mr. Farron? But while he may look as guilty as the blood on his hands in the police photos, bringing J. Michael Farron to justice gets a jolt when he stuns everyone by choosing a dark horse defense attorney himself. There's a famous phrase in the law that anyone who represents themselves as a fool for a client, and typically that's true. But in this case, he may have been no fool at all. Stay with us. The Farron Mansion in New Canaan, Connecticut stands vacant, an empty monument to a marriage and a lifestyle that seemed charmed until it all ended in violence. The family gone, the secrets out. Now that the former White House lawyer charged with trying to kill his wife, Michael Farron. Turn to that former White House lawyer charged with trying to murder his that wife. That high-powered lawyer is facing criminal charges of attempted murder and first-degree assault. Mary Margaret Farron is in hiding with their daughters, one seven, the other just an infant recovering from a terrible beating from her husband. As she tells police the night of the attack, afraid he'll come back to finish the job. I'm convinced that he gets out, he's gonna try to kill me and the girls. Her abuser, her husband, is not hiding. He's not even in jail. Out on $750,000 bond. The lifelong Washington bureaucrat now causing gridlock in the legal proceedings against him for five long years. It was absolutely terrifying my older daughter she just was so worried i was going to be killed we lived in hiding farron the clarence darrow of delay filing motions winning continuances provoking an astonishing 68 court appearances slowing not only the criminal case against him but also a civil lawsuit brought by his now ex-wife mary margaret suing him over the terrible beating he had given her i have lasting injuries from from the attack, I was a super high functioning lawyer who managed so much. And now I have to write everything down that I need to do through the day. I forget where I'm supposed to be. 
I have an incredible, I, I kind of fall to pieces when I have to do too many things at once and to the point of tears and I get easily, you know, overwhelmed. And so there's very lasting effects. How difficult was it for Mary Margaret to have this drawn out for years and years and years? It was torture for her. Barron becomes a regular at the Stanford courthouse. You too, Marshal. Hobnobbing with marshals and journalists. Do you want to do you want to have anything to say this morning? Thank you. It's good to see you. Though. Acting more like a defense attorney than a defendant. Um, as they prepare their civil lawsuit, 12, Mary Margaret's attorneys videotape a deposition a with the dapper former White House operative. I'm going to show you a picture, which we're going to mark as Exhibit 3. And that's a picture of your wife, Mary Margaret Farron, isn't it? I'm not going to respond based upon my attorney's advice. But under hours of questioning, Farron, still facing an eventual criminal trial, takes the fifth. I, I will not respond. I'm not going to respond. I will not respond to not respond to the question. 94 times. What we see in that picture, that was caused by what you did to her, isn't that right? I'm not going to respond based upon my Fifth Amendment rights. Barron later fires his lawyers, Same. deciding to defend himself, but then doesn't show up for the civil trial. This is a case being presented by one side, with a jury there, with no one on the other side. Barron sends a bizarre message to the court, claiming he's been involuntarily committed for psychiatric treatment. He never intended on winning. He just wanted to game the system and get delays. The trial goes on without him, the jury punishing Farron with a $28 million verdict. Then, nearly five years after the attack, the criminal trial. And another surprise. Farron telling the judge he is suicidal and can't bear the strain of attending this trial either. No, Mr. Farron is not with us. Uh, here today in the courtroom. And the second trial marches along with a missing defendant. Mr. Farron may be absent. Let's go call your first witness, please. Mary Margaret Farron. But his brave ex-wife finding the courage to revisit the worst night of her life. He was on top of me and he was squeezing my neck, strangling me and slamming my head, slamming my head into the floor. What was it like to take the stand and testify? It was, it's always hard to relive it. And it's still like, you would hope it would dull over time, but it doesn't. But it's also a day of empowerment in the sense of you're transferring the responsibility of this bad, what happened, this terrible thing to him. And it is a day to speak out. I want to show you some marked state exhibit 37 for identification. The peak moment of excruciating drama, she peers into an evidence bag. You see the horror in her eyes. <laughs> That's the flashlight, Mr. Baron, the defendant used to beat me. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, all. You may be seated. It doesn't take the jury long, just a day. All right, gentlemen, I've received a note uh, from the jury. We have uh, reached a verdict. Barron, like it or not, ordered into court on Judgment Day, forced to listen to the verdict. What say you, Mr. Foreperson? Is he guilty or not guilty of the crime of criminal attempt to commit murder? Guilty. Court is now adjourned. What was it like when the verdict came down? I collapsed and cried, and it was such a relief. At sentencing, Judge Richard Comerford gives Farron 15 years and a tongue lashing. He's being sentenced for the horrific act that occurred here. You don't take it upon yourself to mete out justice, especially not a human being who's dedicated his professional life to the law, especially a human being who professed love for this woman and for his children. The judge orders so Farron is never to see his daughters again. All right. If he serves his full sentence, he'll be nearly 80 years old when he's released. Is 15 years just punishment for what he did? No. I don't see how you put a time frame on something as atrocious 
and egregious. And he's never apologized for what no. he's done. No. Farron is appealing his criminal conviction and the civil judgment against him. My daughter has asked me, why, why did daddy try to kill you? And, and this was right after it happened a couple months later and I said, I don't think I'll ever have a full answer to that. He didn't just snap. No, he definitely did not just snap. It was very purposeful. Do you feel safe now, today? I do. Mary Margaret has a mission now, telling women don't ignore the warning signs. When you're a young woman and you meet this charismatic guy who's so charming and just adores you, but he shows that jealous rage, you know what, think about what your life is gonna be like. And you think you can handle it, and you know what, you can't. If something doesn't seem right when you're with someone initially, listen to yourself. There's a quote that says, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. As of 2015, Michael Farron continues to appeal his criminal conviction and civil judgment. Mary Margaret Farron reports that she and her daughters are doing well, but she is still coping with the physical effects of the attack. She has begun volunteering for groups that support survivors of domestic violence. Coming up, a fiery relationship headed for trouble. When it was good, it was really good. And when it was bad, it was bad. But if she has her way, it's about to get a whole lot worse. <laughs> Stay with us. Jessica Strom fell hard for her fiancé, but when the relationship fell apart, she didn't just want him out of her life, she wanted him dead. But that was hardly the end of the story. As Deborah Roberts first told us in 2014, this twisted tale of two lovers gives the phrase endless love a whole new meaning. You really want to do this? Really? You sure? Yeah. Jessica Strom's planning to give her beloved fiancé, John, a special present. A bullet in the head. Just do it. Just walk directly in. Just close the door. Open the door. No time to respond. Don't be fooled by the flirtatious laughter. This meeting is dead serious. Well, I said, oh, f*** it. You can have a taste of it. So I'm not going to one. She's talking about the man who's supposedly stolen her heart, John Shelfeffer, a former district attorney and now successful lawyer in the quaint town of Wausau, Wisconsin. A doting father of three children, John was divorced and looking for a second chance at love when he walked into this bar. She was young, vibrant, beautiful, all made up behind the bar and we just clicked. Nearly 20 years younger, the beautiful bartender was going through her own divorce while raising two children and studying, of all things, criminology. We got along so well. We were really great friends. And there was attraction, and we got along well, and we can talk for hours and have good times. Yeah. Was it chemistry? Yeah, there's definite chemistry. We just started talking and chatting, and I remember she laughed and she said, I never give my number out, but I'm gonna give it to you. Love was in the air, and within weeks, the May-December romance was flourishing. Did you see her as somebody you wanted to marry? Oh, yeah. I can remember her saying, um, well, you better not be leading me down the wrong path, because when I fall, I fall hard, and I'm falling for you. And that feeling was mutual. When you find that one person who, for some unexplained reason, just, that's your person. <laughs> The betrayal still so raw. Scars from a relationship that ran hot and cold. When it was good, it was really good. And when it was bad, it was bad. The good times included romantic nights, even a trip to Disney World for the blended family. The bad times, the kind of stuff you see on reruns of Cops. She doesn't have an off switch. Like, she won't stop. There was some jealousy and some control issues. On whose part? On, on his part. But John says the problem started with Jessica's volatile temper. How abusive was she? If you can think it, she's probably done it to me. Stomping on my foot, 
with a high heel spike shoe punches to the face. He says her weapon of choice was a restraining order. She filed several after heated arguments. Jessica owns up to some of those vicious fights. I did stab the sofa in the house. I grabbed a knife and I said to him, I said, if you do not give me my car keys and let me leave, I'm going to slice this couch. I just did a slice and then he screamed. He threw my keys at me and I said, thank you. And yet, despite all the drama, the relationship endured. Jessica even moved in with her kids. John, you're a lawyer. You've worked in areas of domestic abuse. Why didn't you just quit this relationship? Because I loved her. We have such a strong bond of love, as, as, as crazy as that sounds, that we would continue to stay together. You know, it was pure. Pure, maybe. Bizarre, definitely. After yet another restraining order hearing, a smitten John actually popped the question to Jessica in front of the judge. He proposed to me on his knee at a court hearing. And a court hearing? Yeah, at a restraining order I had filed. And you had, you had filed a restraining order against him? Yes. Did it never occur to you that this isn't normal? I'm what with my feelings, you know? And he was always there for me. You've got one person who, this is not my fault. This is because of you. This is because of you that I'm doing this. Then you've got another person who is an internalizer. This is my fault. This is my responsibility. I'll take care of this. It's a perfect, like, positive-negative match from a battery perspective because you've got this, like, connection. It's a perfect fit. The start and stop love affair went on for six years until Jessica decided she'd rather plan John's funeral than a wedding. Her chosen hitman, a former classmate from, get this, a criminal justice class she'd just taken. After initially turning Jessica down flat, the man we'll call Alex goes to police. Enter Wausau Detective Jennifer Holtz, who took us back to where that first conversation went down. They sat here and she sprang it on him. Would you kill somebody? Right. Would you ever consider killing someone? And he said, no. Was he completely blown away by the proposition? Did he I say? Think he was, yeah. Was, of course, um, he had gone through criminal justice courses with her. But police needed proof that it was a serious murder for hire plan. We had him call her and he said, hey, I wanted to talk to you about last night. Well, I just kind of wanted to talk about what we uh, had talked about yesterday a little bit. Oh, oh no. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's okay. Yeah, this, I, I figured you wouldn't want to. This was something she didn't want to discuss on the phone. That was a red flag to us that, okay, this, this is real. A serious threat. Right. On the call, the two make a plan to meet later that night at this diner in downtown Wausau to discuss the plot face to face. So this is where they came for the sting? Correct. And where did they sit? And we have them set up in a booth right here. That's Detective Holtz on the video, angling the secret recording device just so, minutes before Jessica arrives. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to order something or not. And the sting is on. So how's it going? Cold. I know. After some small talk about Wisconsin's winter weather, it's down to the murderous business at hand. Okay, well, I'm listening. I don't know if you're willing to take the amount of money that I to do this. Probably not. Probably not. You say yeah. like $50,000 or something. Could you do 25? No. Oh, awesome. You could do it for a thousand. For how much? A thousand. A thousand. A thousand. I think so. If she offered up a thousand dollars and she leaned into him flirtatiously and then also offered sex. Could she really have been serious? I think in her mind that she thought that a thousand dollars and in sex was going to be good enough for him. She goes even further, happily detailing how to get the job done. Yeah. Ah. 
Uh -huh. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. In the mirror. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> so I would draw the picture. She's giddy, even singing while digging out a pen and paper to draw her hitman a map. We told him, give her an out. In fact, he asked her that several times. Are you serious? Are you sure about this? And he even asked her, you know, if you're in a bad relationship, why don't you just leave? I keep thinking, you can just walk away from this. I'm going to walk outside. I'm going to quit. That's true love. One twisted brand of true love. When we return, Jessica has some explaining to do. I can't see anything. I'm getting taken completely out of context. And guess who she'll turn to for help? Honey, I don't know if you can do anything. And then my body started to shake. You've got to hear this. In picturesque Wausau, Wisconsin, single mom Jessica Strom has just sealed a deadly deal, offering a 24-year-old former classmate $1,000 and the promise of sex to kill her fiancé, John Schelfeffer. Sounds so easy. <laughs> no. <laughs> and she's thought of everything, including what she'll do after the hit job if suspicion turns to her. So when they go looking for someone who did this, they're going to be looking for it. Oh, yeah. And what are you going to say? Just. That's what, yeah. Is she for real? When you saw the tapes, was there any doubt in your mind that this was a full-fledged plot to kill her fiancé? Absolutely not. We watched it at our office, and we were all just completely floored by it the context of the conversation and her demeanor. Detective Jennifer Holtz had seen enough and confronted Jessica at her house with her kids asleep upstairs. When the police showed up at your home, what did you make of that? I was half asleep on my couch. I had no idea they were there for that at all. It's 11 p.m. Did she think she was in trouble when you showed up? Initially, I don't believe so. I don't think it occurred to her that we had taped the entire conversation between her and Alan. I've been with John for seven years, and he's done things to me, and I'm things to him too, but it's not like we want to literally kill each other. Well, you seem like a very smart girl. Well, enough to realize that your entire conversation was recorded. Mm -hmm. And what you're telling is not true. And when you learned that the conversation had been recorded, then it came back to me that, oh, okay, this makes sense why they're here. But at the same time, it wasn't real that it was happening. Jessica tells investors she thought the meeting Alex was about something much more mundane murder, saying she was hoping her tech-savvy former classmate could help her sort out Wi-Fi problems. I asked him, you know, can you help me with this internet? And he's like, oh, sure. How did the idea of killing John even come into the conversation? He was frustrating me that earlier that week. But I do know that I said something like, well, you could kill him if you wanted to. But I've seen the tape, and nowhere on there do you talk about the internet. It was all talked about before, and that's what I had believed. That's why I was beating him for. So you're saying this was all a big misunderstanding? Yes, yes. And Even I, though you offered money to someone, gave your fiance schedule, drew a map of his house. Yeah, he knew it wasn't serious. Certainly, you're not joking when you begin to draw maps. <laughs> and make comments about how now your fingerprints are on this map. Never. I love that man, and I would not kill him. No. But yet you're asking this guy to do it. I know it sounds so bad. What did you think about the idea that she wanted to have you killed? At first, I didn't believe it. I thought I was like it was a joke, and then my body started to shake. After he calmed down, John watched this video of his soulmate plotting to end his life. Take three minutes. What do you feel when you look at that tape of yourself? I feel taken advantage of. You feel taken advantage of? I feel taken advantage of. I Even really though do. you're the one who's leading him. He actually led to the conclusion of it all. He's carrying on the conversation. I'm just kind of nonchalantly laughing and singing. No, no. 
But to even come up with a price, a thousand dollars plus yeah, sex. That's nuts. To kill it's, the man that you love? That's nuts. That's crazy. And you know, unfortunately, I'm sitting here as a product of that. Here, meaning the Marathon County Jail, where Jessica has been collecting her thoughts since that night police came knocking. Scared and alone behind bars, she reached out to the one person she knew would answer. I called John first, who's my first call. Honey? Why are you in jail? Um, I'm in here because I said to somebody that I wanted to kill you. I said it as a total joke. I don't know if you can do anything. I don't know that it's in my place to help you. Okay, I what can you recommend that I can do, honey? I'm not getting involved. I am staying out of it. You need to call your attorney. But these days, John's had a Why change of heart. The next day, she calls and says, you need to help me. This isn't real. You know, and six, seven months later, I come to the conclusion that is the truth. So you don't think she intended to have you killed? No. Though John may not have believed his life was ever on the line, a judge did. It's a serious crime. Jessica accepted a plea deal for solicitation to commit first-degree intentional homicide. That will keep her in prison for at least three and a half years. At her sentencing hearing, she blamed who else but John. I stayed doing what I was always doing, trying to please John. John physically abused me. I'm afraid he will not leave me alone. Do you wish you hadn't planned? John's I didn't murder? plan. I did not plan it at all. Never. I shouldn't have said those things. But after all the sex, lies, and that videotape, after all the thousand reasons why this affair should have ended long ago, the two ill-fated lovers still feel that spark. Do you still love John? Very much. Very, very much with my whole heart. I do love Jessica to this day. Still. To this day. In spite of everything. Because I attribute her negative behaviors to the mental illness. Do you still want to be with her in the future? I would say, yeah. And believe it or not, Jessica's also leaving that door open. And when you leave prison, will that relationship ever resume again? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that crazy thing called love. <laughs> if you love someone in your heart, you know, how can you make those feelings go away? As of 2015, Jessica Strom is still serving her sentence. John Shelfeffer says he's focusing on his children and work and thinks his relationship with Jessica is finally over. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.